Welcome to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. I'm Diana Britton, Managing Editor of wealthmanagement.com, and in this podcast, we explore some of the struggles and personal development issues facing advisors and financial services professionals, and how to get to a place of healing for mind, body, and spirit. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Healthy Advisor podcast, and thanks for joining us. As you may know, this is the podcast focused on financial advisor health and well-being, and today's guest has probably become an expert on this subject over the last year. Her name is Tina Powell. She's a partner and chief of community at Intentionally, an RAA marketing company. Uh, Tina, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much, Diana. It really is a, a privilege to be here. Yeah, so I'm ex- especially excited for this podcast because Tina is, you know, not only a, a well-known powerhouse marketer in this industry, but she's also a dear friend. Um, you know, we're both uh, proud members of uh, the Chicken Parm Club, <laughs> um, but um, you know, that's sort of a story for another podcast. Um, but in in November 2022, Tina sold her her own marketing business, C Suite Social Media too intentionally and uh, became a partner in that business. And, you know, if you know, Tina, uh, she's, uh, you know, she's one of the healthiest people in the industry. Um, she looks uh, much younger than she is. She, she looks great. Um, you never know by looking at her that she's a grandmother now. Um, and congratulations, Tina. Um, by the way, uh, she recently became a grandmother. Um, she rides horses. Uh, does regular cardio workouts, um, you know, much more than I do. Um, and, you know, overall, she's just in great shape. And, uh, but um, even so, uh, Tina decided to declare 2023 the year of health. And on MLK Day last, uh, in 2023, January 16th, she paid for a full body scan at the Princeton Longevity Center and she left the center that day with a diagnosis of a tumor on her lung. Um, so, uh, you know, you just kind of never know, right, um, how, uh, what's going to happen. And so, Tina, I wanted you to take us back to MLK Day and, and you know, what made you get that full body scan? What was and uh, what came out of that? Sure. So there's so much to unpack here. The reason why I declared January and the entire year of 2023, the year of health, and that was because partially I went through a transition, uh, a welcome transition with my business. And yes, C-Suite was acquired by uh, Intentionally. And we not only serve REAs, but we also serve uh, fintechs and every all financial companies in the financial services space. So it was wonderful. Like I welcomed 2023 and was excited to just, you know, begin a new chapter. And the one of the reasons, Diana, that I picked January uh, 16th was an MLK day was because that day we had off and I had been doing like, it's a lot of work to transition your, your business to transition your clients to go through an acquisition as all financial advisors listening right now will, will tell you. So I felt that I do things to the nth degree. I'm your classic, mm-hmm. like type A personality. You know, when I was in school, graduate school, got a perfect 4.0 did undergrad, graduated with honors there. It just kind of gives you a sense into my uh, somewhat OCD annoying kind of personality. Um, But I'm the type of person that I take things to the limit. So I said that if I was going to declare 2023, the year of health, that we were going to, we were either going to go big or go home. So Mm -hmm. I made an appointment with the Princeton Longevity Center, and uh, they actually have been around now for over uh, two decades. And the director and founder of the center, Dr. David Fine, is a real, is a pioneer, you know, because 20 years ago, we weren't really talking about longevity. We weren't talking about like healthy aging. 
and you know there weren't amazing uh outlets like your podcast diana where we could there wasn't even really social in the way that there is today that we could get information so i went for the full blown titanium package <laughs> uh so it's it's really important to to make a distinction here is that and that there are many different types of physicals. Everybody's like, asks me, what's an executive physical? I just kind of imagine that I work with da Jamie Dimon <laughs> and that, you know, maybe I was a member of his team. So it's the type of physical that like a Jamie Dimon would do. Uh, it's mm -hmm. all day. You get there at 830 and you leave at 430 knowing your results. So one of the um, features of this scan is uh, what is known as a, a CT scan. Uh, that stands for uh, computerized tomography. Computerized tomography can see details as small as 0.4 millimeters or 1 50th of an inch. And in case anybody's trying to look at, you know, what's that, what's that picture like? That's the average width of a strand of spaghetti. So wow. you can see like it's, it's really small. And I elected for that. That was one of the many things that I did. I met, I had a, I met with a phlebotomy technician who took my blood. So we did blood analysis. Uh, the EKG tech uh, hooked me up to the treadmill. Another tech tech person put me in this like machine that measured my body fat composition, like you name it, I did it. And the computerized tomography, the CT scan is the big, like it's the big kahuna. It, it, mm. it was like, you know, walking into that room was um, daunting. It's a huge piece of technology and, and machinery. And I remember being ushered to the hall. And the first thing that you see is this like big, like this pane of glass, like, you know, when Diana, you know, like when you're watching like crime shows and how they have like somebody being interrogated and how there's like glass behind them. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what this was. And so there was a technician right to the right of me uh, that put an IV and a fluid known as contrast. What contrast basically does is it goes through your body. It's a liquid. And, you know, if there's something there, then it, it lights up. So there was a technician next to me and a technician behind the glass. And I remember like the scan itself was really easy, everybody. So don't get nervous about ever having to go for a CT scan. You want to go, you want to welcome it because a CT scan provides stunningly details of all of your organs. So it's your lung, your pancreas, your bladder in order to detect anything abnormal. And the way that I kind of knew that something was uh, not good was as I was leaving, uh, the technician was escorting me out of the hall and I looked, I looked through the pane of glass and I saw the technician, the other technician, she was like hovered over her computer, like a commander of a Navy submarine. And I tried to make eye contact with her. I could read and feel the emotion on her face. And I just walked out and said, oh, I just, I was like, oh no, this is, this is not good. And then they brought me back to my waiting room. So they basically give you a dedicated waiting room that has like a little sofa and it has a desk. So, you know, if you want to bring your computer and work. So it took about an hour and then I heard a knock on my door like that. And then the technician was ready to bring me into David Fine's office, Dr. David Fine. And, and I sat across the, I sat across the desk from a beautiful mahogany desk, prestigious degrees. Like it was like it was of just beautiful surroundings. I felt very calm. He was very, his voice was reassuring, but when it came for the results of the CT scan, he, the, he put two, two monitors in front of me and then put them in my direction. And they immediately lit up and went from black to white. And he goes, um, he goes, here's a, you know, picture of your lungs. He's like, this looks good. And he goes, but we discovered a 2.1 centimeter tumor on your right lung and we need you to get this checked out as soon as possible. Denise from our front desk will help you to schedule a PET scan. What does your calendar look like for next mm. week? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, what? Hello? Like, are, are you kidding? Did a 2.1 centimeter tumor on my right lung, I was I was flabbergasted. I, I, I couldn't even believe it felt like an out-of-body experience. And I'm like, am I really hit, sitting here 
and he just told me what I thought he told me. And that is a, a 2.1 centimeter tumor on my right lung, because, you know, like in your intro, Diana, yes, I was riding horses three days a week. I was galloping with Sparky, you know, around the mm -hmm. ring. I was doing Latin Pelotons, you know, as in my, my Pelotons and yes, I'm, I'm fit and I, I don't smoke. I did smoke in high school and college for a short time, but I quit like 33 years ago. And so I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was absolutely devastating. It, it was just like a scene you see out of a movie. And I've listened to your podcast before Diana many times. <laughs> and it's even an out of body experience being on it right now, because I never in a million years, like would know that, you know, number one, I would get the diagnosis of lung cancer um, specifically lung cancer, stage B, non-small cell lung cancer, L858, R, uh, Exxon 21. <laughs> I know that's <laughs> a lot of acronyms for, our, for our, our financial advisors out there. Um, but you know, they, my, uh, they put my, um, tumor through, through a test so they were able actually to diagnose what kind of lung cancer it was, which by the way, you know, part of the punchline was that it was related to environmental exposure, like radon. So my oncologist was like, oh, Tina, we've got some good news for you. And, uh, you know, you try to find humor, you, you try to find the light, uh, you know, you look for all signs of like light and positivity when you have a cancer diagnosis and said of all the stages of all the types of lung cancer that this was the type to get, um, because it was very treatable. Hmm. But he said, but it's related. I, I was like, doctor, I, I said to him, um, how, like, how did I pick this up? It's like, you, you've had this in your body. He said, you could have this in your body for Joshua Sabari, Dr. Joshua Sabari, my oncologist at NYU Langone Health said that this could have been germinating in my system for like 20 years. And he's like, wow. And he's like, oh, by the way. And he's like, where were you on 9-11? Were you a first responder? Has your home been tested for radon? What, where, what do you work? Like making sure that I'm not working at like a chemical factory or like a manufacturing facility. Um, because 20% of the cases of lung cancer that are diagnosed are for people who don't smoke, uh, mm. people who have never smoked, like in their life have picked up a cigarette. So, you know, everybody's familiar with Dana Reeves, Christopher Reeves wife, who also who passed away from from lung cancer. Dana Reeves wasn't a smoker. So this type of um, this disease is just, you know, one of the reasons for coming out on your on your podcast. And I thank you so much is because I want everybody listening. Like if there was one thing, there's one thing I learned pretty early. And that is that if you have lungs, you can get lung cancer. It doesn't matter who you are. And it doesn't matter if you smoke or not. Yeah. And I know, you know, it, this is sort of a fear for a lot of people is just getting cancer in general, you know, sort of like a, a nightmare scenario. And what were the symptoms? Yeah. So have. there, yeah, there were a couple of things that happened. And because, um, if you see me, I am the ripe young age of 57 years old. <laughs> I am a, a white Italian American, you know, you could all go to my LinkedIn and, and see what I look like. And I look pretty good. I mean, I take pride in, in taking look great. really good yeah. care of myself. Thank I you. Can, I can attest um, to that. Yeah. but I am over the age of 50. Right. And so women going through menopause. So one of the first symptoms that happen. And Kelly and I, <laughs> Kelly, uh, intentionally co-founder and CEO who acquired my company, her and I were out to dinner in um, October and just kind of like celebrating and putting the final touches on the, the acquisition. That night, Diana, I left the Bluebell Inn in Bluebell, Pennsylvania in an ambulance. And wow. so what happened was, is that I had completely collapsed, like fainted and woke up, woke up on the floor of the restaurant in, uh, I hate to, I will be graphic here because it was pretty serious. I, I woke up in a pool of my own urine. Like it was that bad. I just like completely collapsed. I looked at her. I knew that something was up. And I said to her, I said, Kelly, I, I'm not really feeling well. And she said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, here's the code to my phone. I said, I want you to call my kids and then call an ambulance. And that was the last thing that I, I remembered. Um, oh, wow. 
but uh, you know, I thought like, oh, you know, I was doing uh, a water fast and, you know, I was putting like, I was already giving it an excuse. The, the other thing that happened is that I noticed like very, very subtly, like I noticed my endurance riding horses, like it was somewhat compromised, like just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I thought like, oh, you know, again, I'm making, I'm tired. I'm, I'm working a lot of hours. Like maybe it was that. And even my times in orange theory. So, you know, we all, those of us who belong to orange theory, there are these, there are these periodic challenges. And so what's really cool about orange theory is it goes to your phone. So like my times on my rowing, were a little bit longer, but I was like, oh, I- I'm getting older. I'm like of that, of that age. And, yeah. um, so it, they were really, they were like s- a combination of signs and, and symptoms. But what really made me do the scan was something that was not medically related at all. And that was back in January of last year, Kelly said uh, it was her 40th birthday and we were celebrating. She's like, you know what I want for my 40th? She goes, you guys are going to think I'm crazy. I want one of those full body scans. And, and Diana, I had looked at, looked at it. I called Princeton Longevity Center and looked into it after the pandemic, but decided not to do it because it was too expensive and not a dime was covered by insurance. But as soon as Kelly said that, I swear to God, I knew it was a sign to get checked. And it was like, boom, I called them that day and got the appointment on the 16th. So lung cancer um, and cancer in general, everybody is a lot of times you're asymptomatic, meaning you aren't really showing any signs, nothing really out of the ordinary. Even my blood was fine. My blood cell counts were fine. I even did this cancer test on all my blood as part of that workup, as part of that executive physical titanium package. It showed no signs of cancer. Some most cancers, it, when they're stage four, you know, you're throwing up blood, and you know, there's there's like all kinds of crazy things happen. That's when you really start to see the symptoms. So, you know, I, it's not to scare everybody here, um, but look, I mean, how long was, I don't know how long I was walking around with a tumor in my right lung. It could have been one year. It could have been two years, maybe even three for all that matter. We don't know, you know, here's the thing. It's much, if you wait until stage four, your chances of survival are so much are, are shortened. You have so much leverage when you find the cancer versus the cancer finding you in like yeah. latter stages. So I know people are like stressed out. Should I make an appointment? Should I make it? Should I not? I wouldn't be sitting here right now if I wasn't proactive. You know, you want to deal with things on your terms. You don't want to have to be like rushed to a hospital to have emergency surgery to do whatever because you're, because something, because you're a whatever could be could have a really serious illness at stage four, your best leverage and your best opportunity is to be proactive and be in front of it. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, that's such an important message that we need to listen to our bodies and really prioritize our health. You know, and I, I was actually doing some research about these um, scans and I know like one company that does it is called Prenuvo and they charge about 2,500 for a full body scan um, you can get a, a torso scan for about a thousand dollars. So, you know, I mean, that's somewhat affordable. Um, and uh, I mean, theirs is, is a little bit different. It's more of is the MRI, full body MRI scan, which stands for magnetic resonance imaging. I mean, something that I read is that, you know, um, the the medical community is not quite on board yet with these scans and argue that like the benefits of them won't outweigh the risks of of chasing down um you know a likely benign finding with invasive follow up procedures i mean so that i don't know that was that surprised me but it's it is like a testament to you have to be your own advocate your own healthcare advocate and because even the your doctor might even recommend you not do it. So I don't know. It's, it's, um, that was just surprising to me, but I know that, um, 
you know, you told me that from, you know, about January of this, of, of 2023 to September, your life was terrifying. And I know you went through three phases of treatment um, over that time. Tell me, tell us about those months and, and what you went through. Sure. So we'll go back to getting the diagnosis and what happened after that, which was an incredible chain of events. So after the CT scan, they, uh, the next thing that I did, uh, again, talk to David Fine saying, Denise, will, Denise from our front desk will ha- help you to set up a PET scan. And the, the PET scan was the actual test that confirmed that indeed it was cancer. Every cancer every cancer patient is different. Every type of uh, patient, patient care is, it's like, like portfolio management for some advisors listening, like it's custom to you. So depending on where your tumor is located, I was in really great physical shape, Diana. So that meant that uh, they could perform surgery. So they took a look at my case. um, They presented it to a tumor board, something really interesting that happens at hospitals and, and research hospitals like NYU Langone, where by the way, I immediately, I immediately entered a, a research cohort and told them that they could have extra cells and whatever they wanted and that I want to be part of their uh, research to find cures to cancer. And so my oncologist, Dr. Joshua Sabari said that I would, I mapped out my treatment and said that I would need to have a robotic lobectomy procedure. And a a lobectomy is a procedure that would remove part of my right lung So the way that your right lung is organized is basically three chambers where my tumor were located, was located, was on the upper most um, chamber near my clavicle. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, towards that direction. And he uh, said that we would do that first. And then after that, and then again, depending on what they find when they go in there, there was a procedure before the robotic lobectomy. And the robotic lobectomy is designed to be minimally invasive compared with lobectomy procedures in in years past. So I have an incision that goes from the front of my rib cage all the way to my back. So it's like five incisions. It's not all connected like it used to be. It's like like almost like big stitches. And at the beginning when this happened, it looked like I was like in a shark attack because it follows like a circular geometric pattern. So the the first part was getting that lobectomy, a robotic lobectomy, which was wild. And going into that procedure was terrifying because I didn't know how I would feel. I had a hundred percent of my lung capacity that was measured and calibrated in this like sound a studio kind of thing that I was in. So I didn't know how I was going to feel afterwards. Like, was I going to need oxygen? Was I going to be able to breathe? Was I going to be able to walk up a flight of stairs, get on a horse again, get on a Peloton again, actually work and, you know, and do my job, be, be podcasting again? Like all of these mm-hmm. things were kind of up in the air. So I never knew anybody that had a robe- robotic lobectomy. It's not like, you know, you could put a call out on, you could put a call out on social media actually. Um, so, but I did join a couple of, uh, Facebook closed Facebook discussion groups to see what, um, what would that, that was going to be like. And I still have actually symptoms like, although that the scars are healing quite nicely, the, my part of my rib cage is like still very sensitive and, um, sensitive to the touch and, uh, has a little bit of, uh, like this kind of numbing that happens. And so he basically said that after that first phase was surgery, getting part of the lung removed. And the next phase after that would be chemo. (laughs) And that Mm. chemo had to follow it's formulaic for oncology and cancer that had to be within the four to six weeks after surgery. So I knew like, I was like, okay, mountain number one is the surgery. Mountain number two is the chemo. And the chemo was also in itself, like terrifying. You hear really nobody from chemo ever says like, Oh, this was a a really good experience. And I knew that, uh, that it was, that it was needed. And yes, a patient has the right Diana to say like, well, I don't want to do that. You know, there are, we've heard of cases of famous people that have elected to do uh, alternative 
therapies, like Steve Jobs was a, a case in point, right? I respect everybody's individual individualism. Your oncology and your healthcare providers will tell you and inform you of the standard of care on um, that specific medical terminology to tell you that, hey, if your case is this, uh, mine, stage 2B lung cancer, LA58R, exon 21, and the right lung treatment equals robotic lobectomy procedure plus chemo. And so we had a discussion with that. So I, I said to my, my, uh, oncologist, I said to, oh, and Dr. Amy Kent did my surgery at NYU Langone, by the way, for anybody that's listening, they, she was phenomenal. I credit her and Dr. Sabari with, with saving my life. Mm -hmm. So, um, the chemo was wicked. You know, it lived up to all expectations. I thought that my hair was going to fall out. I said that to my oncologist. I said, is, I'm, it's a question everybody asks, right? Is your hair going to yeah. fall out? I made an appointment for a wig, wig. I had a wig on hold and he goes, well, Tina, you know, he goes, I'm, I'm giving you the Ferrari, uh, which my treatment for anybody listening, uh, cisplatin plus permatrexid, cisplatin for, per, for permatrexid, he recommended for treatments, uh, each three weeks apart. And I did the three, I couldn't do the four. I, I said, look, unless it's absolutely medical, medically necessary, I really was really strong and debilitating and, um, and painful. So he said, well, I could give you something else. If you don't want your hair to fall out, I'm giving you the Ferrari. So I said, okay, let's, let's drive the Ferrari. So that chemo, the last chemo happened at the end of, of May mm. and it stays in your system, actually, Diana, which, you know, for quite a long time, like, it's not just like you have your last therapy and then you're walking around. There are some major league side effects that affect your cognitive abilities, your physical abilities, like having this on top of a surgery, I was like, oh gosh. And I was still full time at work. I mean, intentionally gave me a lot of time off and gave me the, the, the grace Kelly and Megan, my partners here. Um, I, I just adore them and will always remember how gracious they and the entire team was, you know, during that treatment, but you know, it was hard to balance everything. And I, I wanted to be at work. There's only so much YouTube and Netflix that you can binge watch. And <laughs> for me, and for, for other cancer patients, uh, and this is part of the reasons why we rush back to work is because we want the resemblance of a normal life. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're sitting in bed, you're reminded of kind of how sick you are when you show up at work and you might not be a hundred percent, you might only be like 50 or 60%. It gives you something else to think about, you know, it's, and, and me, uh, you know how much I love marketing and digital and social and all of these themes and, you know, working with people and working with advisors. I mean, I, I love it. So, um, that was phase two. And then, um, phase three <laughs> was a targeted therapy during surgery. After you have any type of cancer surgery or any surgery to remove anything in your body, it goes through a series of testing. Mm. And so, um, there is, a, a medication, it's a, a pill that I take every day, uh, that helps to, uh, prevent this from ever, you know, from showing up ever again. And it's been clinically proven. There's a site called PubMed, which is basically like, it's a Google, it, it's a Google ecosystem for all things medical. So you could put in search terms of your, your different, even your medication, and it will, you know, present the findings and all that. So it has been clinically proven to be effective, but at the same time, there were, there are side effects with that drug. Number one, you can die. Number two, you could have a heart attack, <laughs> you know, oh, all of these things. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so maybe actually I don't want to go on this. Um, but there's, you know, other things again, your health, you, you said it best, Diana, you're, you're your best advocate. You know, I had to sit down with my internal board of directors and say, okay, my, my mother, my, my children, Rachel and Dave, Mark, you know, my brother, Tony, you know, what was I going to do here? Was I going to take the medication or not take the medication? And 
And even my oncologist, I had multiple conversations. I moved my oncology team to, to UPenn, Dr. Melina Marmalellas here at, at Penn Medicine. You know, and I weighed the pros and cons and I said, okay, let's do it. And the philosophy there is, it's very Philly-like, it's very Eagles-like, you know, you throw your best offense, it just you throw your best offense at whatever the, at the problem at hand, just like you, like you don't wait until a problem shows up. It, you just obliterate it right from the beginning, like get out the bazooka and just what? start, you know? And so that's what they do. They don't, they like, they got, got out the bazooka and I said, okay, so I've been on that medication now since the end of June. So it, the reason why Diana, it was so terrifying is I've gone from, okay. So there was stress associated with the, with the surgery, check the mm. box, got that stress associated with chemo, check the box, finish that. And then again, this targeted therapy, there were some horror stories, people's nails falling off and, you know, all kinds of things. And okay, we'll just, we'll, we'll try it. And so I go, I monitor now, uh, every six weeks also too, there's an effect on the other parts of your body too, your, your blood cell counts and, and whatnot. So terrifying equals the unknown. And, you know, I know a lot of advisors and I know a, a lot of your audience, Diana, can relate to the fact that, you know, when you, there's unknown, whether or not it be in your own health or financial markets, that causes anxiety and a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's it. I like the way that my oncology team mapped it out for me. And I, I allowed myself, I said, okay, Tina, I'm not going to solve for problems that are an area here. I made a, an intentional effort to just stay in the present and whatever phase I was in, whether or not that was the surgery or the chemo or the, um, uh, targeted therapy, I was not going to worry about this, the other stages, but only the stage that I was in. Mm. Well, I love that analogy from from the Eagles. That's great. And, you know, I think, Tina, a lot of us have, um, you haven't really masked your, you know, the illness and what you've been going through. And, you know, why did you sort of decide to go public and, and be very public about what you've been going through? I felt a, a responsibility. I felt a responsibility to change the narrative around lung cancer. I was shocked, Diana, that this happened to me. And immediately I went on Instagram and all of a sudden I discovered so many people around the, not only the United States, around the world that have this type of diagnosis. And there are people that you see every day. There are people who look fine. There are people who are smiling. There are people that are just like, everyday, everyday people. And lung cancer has gotten such a, a bad rap. It, it's such a shameful type of cancer for people that the, the, most of the people think that it's it, the, the medical community has shown like 85 year olds or 80 year olds with, you know, coughing up blood and with trachs and, you know, that's, I wanted to change the perception of that. And I wanted to just wake everybody up the way that I needed to wake up call and say, hello, mm -hmm. if, if this happened to me, this could happen to you. And I, not to scare everybody, Diana, but to be like, there, there were, be really super proactive about your health. There were other cases that I learned of people who were at latter stages of me, of my lung cancer, because they were told by a doctor, oh, it's the flu. Oh, it's the pandemic. Oh, it's acid reflux, who then were screwed because then they went from like stage two to like stage four. And so I said to myself, it was my own like PSA. And I wanted to let everybody know that he here I am, you're all looking at me and thinking like everything is great and everything is not great. And if I could go around looking somewhat normal and have a tumor inside of me, that that was just a big wake up call for, uh, for financial services. So that was, that was number one. Uh, another reason, which I didn't necessarily have in the back of my head, but that 
like that started to happen is that it was kind of like a cry for help Hmm. as that I knew that by putting it out in the universe, you know, and you know, I'm active on social media and I I don't believe that social media should be just a hit reel. And I felt the responsibility as being whatever you want to call it, social influencer. I wanted everybody to know that my life was not okay, that my life was actually really the, the actually terrifying. Um, and that I was dealing with a lot. I, you know, there were, obviously I put a a complete stop to travel and conferences. I didn't want to hide. I didn't want to take my energy that I could use for healing and use it to lie to people, to their face. And just being like, and again, not showing up at events and people saying, Oh, where, where is she? Oh yeah. She, you know, she doesn't, she, she couldn't make it or, or whatever. I wanted people to know the honest truth that I was dealing with something that was not only utterly terrifying, but really utterly unknown to me. I had no idea how I was going to cope. Uh, it was like, there were some days, Diana, that felt like it was like minute to minute, hour to hour. And then all this, by the way, happened as I was becoming a grandmother like for the first time, my daughter's pregnant. My kids were just newly married Two two marriages in, in 2022. Uh, so, you know, parts of my life were just blossoming and then I got that, that diagnosis. So one of the outcomes, and I, I want to mention him, Ryan Metzler from Finlocity reached out to me and he has a relative who's a, one of the only uh, stage four lung cancer she's an outlier, Susan Warmadam. Oh, he put me in touch with her from the beginning. And I was able to interview a stage four cancer wow. survivor of lung cancer. And what that did was like, that was the the help that I was crying out for was the help that I received. And I was able to say, Hey, and now she's been cancer free for, for four, for mm. 10 years. So you never know what life and what the universe is going to reflect back to you. If you, you know, allow yourself to be open and vulnerable, like vulnerability that you've never, the kind of vulnerability you've never experienced in your, in your life, you'll be surprised at what comes to you just through the, the, the sheer act of like, spontaneity, randomness, the power of the universe, God, whatever you believe, I believe it all to be true. Mm. Wow. I I mean, I, your story is just such an inspiration, Tina. Are you cancer free now? Do you? I have no evidence of disease today. I have no evidence disease. My lungs are perfectly clear. And my blood is perfectly clear. And what I do is every 12 weeks, I go for scans of my lungs, my brain, and my pelvis. My brain and my pelvis are rotated every 12 weeks. So again, the, the oncology team in Philly here is just there. They are mm-hmm. aggressive and they are very bullish on, on care. So cancer of any kind has the potential to spread. I've known of breast cancer patients who thought that they were okay, where they looked at their breasts and they had no evidence of disease over there. And oh, by the way, a year later, they were diagnosed with a brain tumor. So my oncology team takes things very, very seriously, knowing that this is a cancer that could spread to various parts of the body. And, um, so every 12 weeks I'm going for those scans. Uh, my next appointment is actually January 8th and they do the scans as well as the blood. Uh, so th- we're looking at every, uh, mile marker available. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's great news and, and we're just so, so thankful Tina that you're here with us. And, um, I, I'm just really grateful that you, that you came on the podcast to share your story. I know it's not easy, you know, kind of rehashing the last year that you've been through and um, that that tough diagnosis and and treatment and some of the terrifying things you've you've gone through. Um, I think this is just a I do think it's a great message for our listeners, because especially as we're starting 2024 right now, this episode is going to air in January and folks are thinking about 
uh, you know, kind of taking a step back and looking at life from a more holistic standpoint. You know, what do I want 2024 to look like? Do I want to prioritize my health? Do I want to prioritize my finances, my work? You know, and folks are thinking about resolutions. So I think this is a great thing to think about, not only think about, but to take action on, right? To be proactive. And there are so many resources out there. But I mean, I could talk about this all day with you, Tina. I, 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 and you know, you know, I love you. I'm, I'm just huge, huge fan of yours. But uh, we're, we're just about out of time. So I just need to uh, want to wrap up. But I'd like to thank, uh, thank you, Tina, for, for being on the podcast and, and sharing your story with me. Thank you so much. Diana, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Surprising to be here. And I've always been a fan of yours and the work that you're doing with the Healthy Advisor. And now more than ever, I can tell you that the work that you're doing has impacted me throughout the years. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity and praise you and uh, this podcast for all that you're you're doing right now to lift us all up. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's great to have, to surround yourself with folks that, you know, have gone through something similar to you. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that's um, brings comfort and support to people who are listening to the podcast. Um, if you'd like to reach out to Tina, uh, you can reach her at Tina at grow intentionally.com. And you can also look her up on LinkedIn if you have a, a struggle yourself and you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at diana.britton at informa.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor. If you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your particular situation.